Well, it's going to be hard to top that performance, unless I'm actually electrocuted by the water on the table there. But um, hi, my name is Peter. I'm from the University of Aberdeen. Um, the head of my department, Josh, told me that I shouldn't be worried about performing first thing on a hungover Saturday morning because he said the archaeologists that come to a conference first thing on a hungover Saturday morning are really keen about archaeology. So you're the best possible audience. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So uh, today we're going to talk about John Banville. John Banville is an Irish author. Um, he won the Booker Prize in 2005 and is considered one of Ireland's leading candidates for the Nobel Prize to the point where in 2019 someone actually uh, phoned him in a very cruel prank and told him that he'd won it. Um, and unfortunately that didn't happen, but who knows. Uh, under the name John Banville, he writes poetically dense fiction, which we'll focus on today because uh, of the theme. He also writes historical crime novels under the pseudonym Benjamin Black. Um, so why should archaeologists be interested in John Banville? Uh, first of all, his writing is preoccupied with the past. If he's not trying to recreate the past in his fiction, he is musing on it thematically. As a result, much of the literary scholarship surrounding Banville compares his work to that of historian, but of course I'm biased, and I think uh, he should apply to archaeologists archaeology just as well. Uh, this is supported by another theme of Banville's work, his preoccupation with what he calls the poetic possibilities of language uh, and its ability to capture the thing itself. And we'll try to drill down into a bit about what he means there. He claims his non-genre fiction is a type of poetry in prose, which explores the potential and the limitation of language's ability to capture reality and the past, echoing a lot of post-processualism, of course, and similar archaeological thought. Uh, finally, I am especially interested in his focus on the object, which I interpret as a focus on the material world and surface detail and a difficulty at getting at this reality in language. Um, so obviously this focus on material reality is of special interest to archaeologists, and that's why I think a whistle-stop tour of Banville's work may be of use. So to start on that tour then, in the early days, his preoccupation with the past has been uh, apparent for decades. So riffing on Percy Shelley, he once observed that novelists are the unacknowledged historians um, of the world. And in his earliest work, he took this quite literally. So he started up writing kind of postmodern historical novels. In the novels Dr. Copernicus and Kepler, he takes a separate scientist from history and dramatizes their search for truth. Already in these novels, he's displaying a certain postmodern cynicism about humanity's capacity to be objective. In Dr. Copernicus, for instance, a key theme in the protagonist's arc revolves around his realization that although everything had a name, the thing cared nothing for its name, had no name for its name, and was itself only. So basically, humanity needs language to navigate reality, but language and reality will never completely align. Although Copernicus, uh, who again was a historical scientist, will use the language of mathematics and his own scientific writings to create new heliocentric discourse. It's proven that the old view that the sun uh, revolved around the earth, he can never fully capture the thing itself. As the critic Derek Hahn puts it, Copernicus, and by implication all seekers of knowledge, including scientists and artists and perhaps even archaeologists, can only temporarily bridge the gap that separates what Hahn calls the word from the world. So Hand argues that Banville reinforces this theme throughout his book, so Dr. Copernicus is initially written in this kind of neutral third-person style, and then it gives way to different letters written by different characters, and finally it's this kind of spoof biography by a real prejudiced, bombastic biographer called Redicus. So it is apparent that scientists are not the only seekers of knowledge in Banville's line of fire in this early work, and this becomes especially clear in the Newton letter, in which an Irish historian rents a cottage on a rundown Protestant estate in the hope of at last finishing his book on Isaac Newton. The historian gets distracted on a sabbatical, no surprises there, and the work is never finished. <laughs> in this novel, Banville doubles down on what Hand calls the gap between the word and the world. So early in the sabbatical, the historian complains that the illustrations in his birdwatching guidebooks would not match up with the real specimens before me. Every bird looks like a starling. Uh, there's a bit of foreshadowing because, of course, as the novel, novel continues, this anxiety spills over into the narrator's view of his own career and discipline. So at one point, he bitchily mocks the language of an academic rival, criticizing the banality of writing things like Newton was the greatest genius that science has produced. But before long, he's attacking the tropism of his own abandoned work. Oh, yes, you can see, can't you, the outline of what my book would have been. A celebration of action of the scientist as hero. Wishy-washy medievalism kicked out and the age of reason restored. And of course, this was written in the 80s, but if you, if you were to find a, a biopic or a non-fiction book written about Newton today, it'd probably still hit those same beats. Uh, by the end of the uh, uh, novel, um, uh, the, the character summarizes his own story, which is a, a basically just a work abandoned during an affair in the country, and an image that combines bafflement and revelation compares himself to a man living underground who, coming up for air, is dazzled by the light. So in other words, by deconstructing the limits of his language and his work, the historian has been left confused and a bit depressed, but he has learned something. 
Uh, so this book marks a turning point in Banville's poetic fiction. He is now known in part for his disdain of tropism. Books like The Sea and Eclipse and The Blue Guitar tend to ignore such mainstays of fiction as plot, story and even character. Instead, Banville chooses to focus on language. He says there's, you can find poetry in verse and prose, but sorry, he, he says it's more likely to be found in prose. <laughs> it's his opinion. Um, and though he has marginally moved on from writing historical novels in his fiction, the past remains a major theme. So most of his novels uh, since the 90s revolve around scholarly men of a certain age dealing with a crisis uh, by delving into the past and that has produced some lovely images here's some of my favorites from the sea his book prize winning novel the past beats inside me like a second heart it's a lovely image there and then here in ancient nights you can see my dead are alive to me for whom the past is a luminous and everlasting present alive to me at lost except in the frail afterworld world of these words so kind of reinforcing that theme he set up in copernicus and newton letter that the past can only be known through language um, so by this quick tour of Banville's work, I've been trying to demonstrate the development of his view that recreating the past, indeed any aspect of reality, is ultimately hobbled by the limits of language itself. We can see how this is applicable not just to history but archaeology as well. Like Banville's characters, when we explore the past, we are attempting to get as close as we can to the thing itself. But no matter how much we study the physical materials of that reality, sooner or later, like Copernicus in the Sun or the unnamed historian in the letters of Isaac Newton, we have to eventually put pen to paper or get up on the podium and explain in words what we've learned about the object of our study of all the limitations that implies. Um, of course, this philosophy fits in very well with post-processual archaeology and similar movements in the discipline. I'm thinking in particular of Michael Shanks, who argued that neutral scientific language is impossible. Uh, this is an intriguing but much criticised point in the fact some archaeologists do maintain, still maintain, <laughs> the opposite. So in archaeological fantasies, for instance, a great book about pseudo-archaeology in a discussion of the attraction of non-rational archaeological hypotheses, Nick Fleming argues that the writing style used in professional publications, by which he means specifically archaeological journals, should not be persuasive or hectoring. Fine writing or glowing sentences, rich in adjectives and superlatives is strongly discouraged. A deadpan factual presentation is the ideal. So this seems perfectly reasonable, but it does present a problem. If you're removing adjectives from your sentences, if you're mimicking a deadpan tone, if you are, in other words, adopting a particular style in order to get published, you are adapting a persuasive style. A neutral or scientific style is still a style, which is more persuasive in the context of an academic journal, in the same way a bug-eyed, conspiracy-laden style uh, would be good for Netflix uh, documentary of like aliens building the pyramids. So uh, this is obviously not a new problem to archaeologists, but it remains an important one, and it's a problem where John Banville's work can overlap with some of our own, because Banville believes in style. When justifying the lack of plot in his novels, he is fond of quoting Henry James, who said, in literature, we move through a blessed world in which we know nothing except by style, but in which also everything is saved by it. So this is not so far from what Fleming believes about academic journals, although the archaeologist is less optimistic about how blessed we are by this. Uh, Banville is concerned with the, like Fleming, about the effect of the style on his reader's ability to understand reality, on the writer's ability to accurately represent reality and or the past. So Derek Hahn points out, for instance, that in the Newton letter, the story often vacillates between this kind of formal and footnote employing academic manner, which is seemingly objective compared to the character's default lush prose. Han suggests this technique reflects the nar narrator's anxiety over language, but I also detect a hint of something more barbed. So the, the extract, when, when he slips into the scientific historian style, it tends to be at critical points where he's at um, uh, emotional crisis. And so I think the narrator's retreat the jargon scans as an active card, as to me it's a way of the character way of escaping uh, the emotional tension of the moment and also it's kind of used to to demonstrate that you can't really capture the intensity of moment in scientific jargony language and I think that's part of what Banville's trying to get across. Uh, that's not to say that um, the uh, Banville is not um, ignorant of what Fleming sees as the dangers of fine writing. So in his novel Ancient Light, for example, the narrator critiques a biography called The Invention of the Past, echoing that postmodern classic, The Invention of Tradition, supposedly written by a scholar whose surname, J.B., is a phonetic representation of Banville's initials. So here's a narrator's critique of J.B.'s style, rhetorical in the extreme, dramatically elaborated, wholly unnatural, synthetic and clotted. It is a style such as might be forged, le mot juste, by a minor court official at Byzantium, say, a former slave whose master had generously allowed him the freedom of his extensive and eclectic library. So he's taking the piss out of himself there. And perhaps some of his critics, but he's also making this postmodern joke, which is, of course, that the character is critiquing his creator's style in a parody of that style, uh, because, of course, the character's critique is still being written by the creator. So Banville is simultaneously demonstrating, yeah, that the excess is a purple prose, but also suggesting how difficult it is to escape the prejudices of one's own taste. So I've been wrangled with the limitations of language and style when attempting to represent the past. What is Banville's solution? So the first clue can be found in the author's declared interest in Samuel Beckett, 
Irish fiction from the 20th century onwards often split into two main camps of influence, James Joyce and Samuel Beckett. So according to this chain of reasoning, uh, Joyce is the kind of writer who puts everything into his writing. So more detail, more references, more plot perhaps. Uh, certainly everything governed by a belief that anything can be represented in language if the language is intense and lush enough. Whereas Beckett, suffering from a kind of anxiety of influence that came after Joyce, uh, takes everything out, goes the opposite direction, takes out the references. Pardon? Sure, uh, that, that, that's good. It uh, takes out the plot, out the detail, and basically believes that you just can't capture reality in language. So Banville has expressed uh, enthusiasm for this dichotomy and declares himself to be in Beckett's camp. So although uh, Beckett often implied he was above style, uh, here he compares it a style to a bow tie on a throat cancer, and also famously he used to write in French to try and keep his prose simple. Uh, the irony is, of course, Beckett's style is nevertheless very distinctive and has often been described by um, uh, John Banville as a style which is uh, classical, poised, well, it has been described by John Banville as a style which is classical, poised, incantatory, uh, yet one that will admit the chaos. That's important, this idea of admitting the chaos. Uh, and the whole description there, in fact, could probably apply to the prose of John Banville himself. So by declaring himself in the Beckett camp, uh, Banville is declaring an interest in confusion confusion, which could be a philosophical excuse for his lack of plot, perhaps, but it's certainly one in keeping with his interest in the inability, inability of words to capture reality. So the historian in a Newton letter, who we saw earlier, who is at a loss to understand the past and describes himself as blinded by sunlight, is in a very Beckettian state of mind. Uh, and as archaeologists, we might recognize this confusion. So unlike the Joycean historian, who has an orgy of uh, oral and written sources to, to, to draw upon, a wealth of words to play with, uh, the archaeologist is a bit like one of Beckett's protagonists. We grub about for bones and rubbish in the mud. I'm being a bit flippant, but you understand my point. How do you write about the past when so little can be known, when the material is physical and separate from the world, se so separated from the world of language? Um, Banville's frequent advice to aspiring writers is taken from Cato the Censor's advice to young orators. I, I'm not going to attempt that Latin there, but uh, in the translation is, seize upon the object and the words will follow. So Banville has been artfully vague about explaining this interpretation of this his interpretation of his mantra, although perhaps uh, this extract from an essay he wrote provides a clue. So the rotten polished object itself, that is what interests me, in confrontation with the total enigma, all of the artists can do, it seems to me, is set up analogues, parallel microcosms, tiny models of the whose original which the mind may play in earnest. We saw in Dr. Copernicus in the Newton letter, Banville believes there are many parallels between artists and other fields, and so perhaps his entreaty to seize upon the object might apply to archaeologists as well. But what does it mean, Summon up now? For me, the phrase, seize the object and the words will follow, work as a summary of the themes we've discussed so far. Season upon the object means focus on reality itself and hoping that, and, and understand that all language must stem from this, but understand that the words that stem from this process are only a map and not the thing discussed. It does not mean adopting a neutral or scientific style necessarily, because that is itself a subjective phenomenon which exists outside the object and, as Banfield suggests in his parodies, can be quite ineffective. We know everything by style, but the search for an accurate descriptive style is a messy process, which returns us to Beckett and the need to admit the chaos. As archaeologists who work in large part with silent materials, we must be especially open about the distance between the word and the world. Uh, which words and what, what what order best represent reality? That was I should have said that sentence aloud before I wrote it, but I'm afraid the problem of objective style does not have an easy answer. But perhaps by reading Banville, we can work towards a solution. Thanks for uh, listening to my presentation.